What's going on guys? Another Dr. Ferrari video. If you aren't sure on who he is or what this is, watch my other Dr. Ferrari video, which I'll link below. We're gonna get straight into this one. So we're back on his website. Instead of looking at the articles, we're gonna be looking at his forum. So Dr. Ferrari actually has a forum on his website and there's a whole heap of articles, uh, actually not articles, threads, which I've gone through all the way to the start. I haven't clicked on every one, but I've looked at the interesting ones. So there's like 1300 different threads here, which um, I've gone to the bottom of. Some of the things I love is, <laughs> he's obviously not spending hours in here responding to random anonymous people's questions. So some of him, some of his stuff is really to the point. So someone's saying, doctor, and they all call him doctor. Doctor, I have tooth pain in my front two tooth. I've been taking antibiotics. You know, how should I manage my training camp? You should consult your dentist. Dot, 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 dot. Next one. Single leg training. Hi, doctor. Do you suggest doing single leg training? At what intensity and cadence? Can you recommend some single leg workouts or intervals? Thanks. I do not suggest single leg training. <laughs> so, uh, no single leg training on the bike. I'd agree with that. Single leg training in the gym, though, different story. So, unilateral strength training uh, in the gym with weights, totally different story. But yeah, single leg stuff on the bike, un <laughs> unclipping one foot and then doing single leg pedaling drills, probably not doing much and just making you look like a bit of an idiot. Um, next thread, sleeping pills. Bit of a longer one here, so let's have a read through. I thought this is pretty interesting. He's obviously got a very good insider knowledge on some of this stuff that goes on in the world to us. So um, again, we can't take everything he says as pure truth. But we, we can take it on board, take it on notice, if you will. Um, Dear doctor, do you think the use of sleeping pills could be the reason for a lot of heart failures in cyclists in the last few years? In my opinion, heart failure in cyclists is not incidental. A few cyclists with heart failures, Lars Bohm, Robert Hessink, ooh, ooh, something De Vries, Davy Gunst, Gianni Meersman, Ram... Ramnus Navardauskas. Dauskas. Oh, there's a lot of names. Okay, I'm not going to waste your time <laughs> butchering all those. So he's so basically, yeah, there's a, there is a lot of um, athletes that have sudden sudden death, so sudden cardiac death from from heart failures. So obviously, not these guys aren't all dead, but they've had issues in the past. Um, so he says, Stillnox, which is a sleeping drug. Um, has been abused by cyclists in the last 30 years. The abuse was frequent in Benelux and France. Recent studies show a relationship with heart failure. In my opinion, it is true. So, yes, sleeping drug abuse by cyclists. Why would they be? Why would cyclists be using sleeping drugs? Aside from cyclists using sleeping pills sort of recreationally, and there were some stories coming out, especially like in the Australian swimming team, there was. They seem to be using them like recreationally i don't know why you would want to do that but i think maybe in combination with alcohol they were taking them or uh there was i can't i'd probably have to go look it up i can't remember but there was definitely cases where um athletes were using them not to just go to sleep um you know maybe if you're also abusing stimulants if you're using like um drugs to lose weight that have a stimulant effect and then you can't sleep like things like modafinil that keep you that have a stimulant effect and then you're needing sleeping pills to counteract that effect that could be happening, so that's just speculation. Anyway, let's keep reading. Do you recommend sleeping pills in general to improve recovery by longer and easier sleeping? Never suggest to anyone. Yeah, so if you need sleeping pills to go to... If you think, I'm going to have a sleeping pill, I'll sleep for longer to help my recovery. I mean, I think everyone knows that's just a terrible idea. Um, here we go. Last comment on this thread I thought was quite funny. This is the main why I included it. Do you recommend melatonin, GABA, tryptophan... That's a, an amino acid. Magnesium to improve sleeping. Those ones might are, are not harmful, right? So he recommends melatonin, magnesium, and sex to, <laughs> to improve your sleeping. So very to the point. Uh, magne yeah, magnesium, I'm not sure why that would improve your sleep. Melatonin to sort of regulate your sleep cycles and then sex maybe to relax you. So if you'd like, give any of those a go. Report back in the comments. Um, drop in performance. Dear doctor, I am at the end of a mesocycle, a bit tired, and today's soglia session, that's like a training, if you know Italian, you'll know what, that's, I think that's like an intensity, maybe like low intensity, anyway, with one effort at 100% of uh, AT4, zone 4, so that would be threshold, felt like I was above threshold, is this normal? <laughs> His reply, it is normal, you feel more fatigued at the end of a mesocycle, so... 
I just meant to clear that one at the start. That was one of his straightforward responses. But anyway, getting into the more interesting threads. Um, boosting natural EPO. So, bit of a bit of a sketchy topic to be asking Dr. Ferrari about. But let's have a read through. Found a lot of natural products on articles out on the net. Is it possible to boost one's natural EPO with natural products to a meaningful result? How far can we boost natural EPO production? Um, there are no supplements able to boost natural EPO. Then he says, <clears throat> hypoxia, meaning being uh, reduced oxygen, so at something like altitude, and proper nutrition, and pro so protein intake, are useful at stimulating e natural EPO. Yeah, so hypoxia, we know that can sort of stimulate increase in red blood cells. That's pretty interesting. But the main reason I included this one was... Um, this person asked more about sort of doing altitude tents and stuff. There isn't actually, I got another thread about altitude, but back to this one. Dr. Varari says, normobaric hypoxia is less effective than hyperbaric hypoxia, natural altitude. Probably because there is less, there are pressure receptors stimulating EPO production. I had actually never heard of this before. At university, we did, we looked at, we, one of the units we studied, out, effective altitude training, and I. this is not something I was aware of. Now, I would probably need to go and look into this, but it's just it's it's stimulated a you know interesting conversation. So, what this actually means is hype by hypoxia he means low oxygen. So, if he says something's doing hypoxia means sleeping at altitude, going to altitude. But normobaric hypoxia, so baric meaning pressure, so having low oxygen hypoxia at normal pressure, so at sea level, meaning something like sleeping in an altitude event a tent is less effect. He says it's less, of, and I'd probably take his word for it. He would, if anyone in the world is going to know about stimulating EPO um, naturally or unnaturally, he's probably the guy. He says it's less effective than hyperbaric, so low pressure hypoxia. Um, so hyperbaric meaning low pressure, so being at altitude, and then hypo um, hypoxia meaning low oxygen. So he's saying basically a fancy way of saying exposing yourself to low oxygen through an altitude tent at sea level is less effective than sleeping at altitude where you get that um, decreased pressure. Um, and he says probably because there are pressure receptors stimulating EPO production. That's really interesting. So what he's saying there is he thinks when you're sleeping at altitude, your body can detect the decrease in pressure as you go to when, when you're up at altitude and that would that can increase and that can help increase the stimulation of EPO production alongside the low oxygen levels at altitude. So he's saying it's not just the low oxygen at altitude that can stimulate EPO production, it's also the decrease in pressure, which is I had actually never heard of until I looked up this thread. So interesting sort of hypothesis. I would need to spend a lot of time looking at the research on this to sort of validate this, but just an interesting uh, take on the whole sleeping in altitude tent sort of topic. And then final thing here, echinacea herb appears to be best at boosting EPO. And so he's listed some things that might work. So echinacea, stragulus, angelica, sinensis, dung, blah, 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 all these herbs, he says, but they don't really work. So it doesn't appear, yeah, I'd sort of agree, these sort of natural herbs, um, these sort of natural um, tonics, herbs and stuff, they might have other benefits like echinacea, maybe it has is high in um, some nutritional properties. So it's not saying they're totally useless, but they're not going to, um, boost your EPO production. Continuing on the altitude tent sort of thing, so this person's asking, what's the best procedure for sleeping at altitude in an altitude tent? And he says he doesn't like altitude tents because of the bad quality of, of sleep impairing recovery. So when you're sleeping in an altitude tent, uh, they get really humid in there, they're kind of uncomfortable, and then, and then just simply having that lower level of oxygen can decrease your sleep quality. So you can't, when you're doing an altitude protocol in an altitude, sleeping at altitude, you can't train the same amount because your recovery is way slower. You can't just do the same training, go sleep in a tent and expect to get benefits because you just won't recover. So he's saying there, he doesn't really like altitude tents and prefers altitude camp. So sleeping at altitude, that obviously has its own hurdles and is difficult to implement in itself, but he thinks that's more effective than altitude tents. Um, and then he's given some recommendations here in terms of what altitude you should be sleeping at, how long you need to do it for, how long you need to be in the tent, etc. And then the other point here that I made, I think I made this point in um, another, maybe one of my Q&A videos, that if you're doing 
um, an altitude tent protocol sleeping in an altitude tent in your home at sea level, you need to be in the tent a long time. You can't just go in there for seven or eight hours a day and sleep. You probably need to be in there for more like 12 to 14 hours ideally to get most of the benefit. So you kind of got to be in there from like, you'd have to, as soon as you start winding down in the afternoon, you should probably hop in there and be in there for a longer period of time just your, than your sleeping window. And here we go, final thread. This one was about Matthew Vanderpool, which I thought was interesting. So this poster was asking, hey, dear doctor, do you know Matthew, do you know Matthew Vanderpool? What's your opinion? Is his performance and talent? Um, blah, blah, blah. So this was back in February 2016. So we know what Vanderpool's gone on to since then. But Ferrari said, Matthew Vanderpool has a huge talent and impressive performances, but I do not know him and his potentiality. And then this person replied asking, now what does talent actually mean? Does this mean you just come out and you're on a super high level naturally? Or do you also improve faster? And Dr. Ferrari says, talent also means trainability. Faster improvements with the same training volume slash intensity. And this is something I've seen. And you know, maybe I could do an entire video on this. But I think a lot of people think, oh, this person's talented. They naturally have a high VO2 max. And that sets them up well to be a good athlete. But that's one part of it. The other part, which a lot of people forget, is you can take two people doing the exact same training and the talent means doing the exact same training, you're just going to respond faster. Like the example I've had, someone like Jay Vine, he just responds to training faster than pretty much anyone else that I know. Like you would literally see him, you would see him in a race, you come back a couple of months later and see him, and you could literally see the difference in his quads. Like the, his muscles had grown. You could physically see a difference and he is just it's not like he was doing training like he still trained very hard but he wasn't doing training that other people wouldn't do he wasn't doing anything special wasn't doing anything particularly out of the ordinary he was training smart but he just adapted to it faster than 99 percent of other people and that's part of being talented isn't just you you're starting from a higher level firstly you start from a higher level and you're increasing faster than than um pretty much anyone else so that's what talent means and it kind of gets lost as well. Like when we look at pro athletes, uh, I think a lot of people have this misunderstanding that professional cyclists in particular are doing totally different training than anyone else. They're going and doing like 30, 40 hour training weeks and or all these specific different efforts that other people aren't doing. They've got this secret training source that no one else knows about. And it's just not the case. I think if most people would be surprised if they look at a professional cyclist training, just how normal it is and how many other even just domestic level cyclists would be doing a similar amount of training. They just don't adapt anywhere near as quick. And most of that comes down to talent. Um, so it's just an interesting thing to chat about. So I thought that was an interesting third as well. So yeah, I'll end the video there, guys. Hope you found it interesting and got something out of it. And I'll catch you in the next one.